Welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. Thank you for choosing to spend a little time with us on our Thursday night Bible study. And I pray that you will receive something that will bless your heart in the uh, days to come. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, help us to recognize when we have a reason to rejoice or have joy so that we can praise you and bring joy to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our lesson for tonight comes from Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 11, uh, the King James Version. That's Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. And uh, most of our focus will be basically on chapter 2. It reads, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. And verse six says, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commanded his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved through, uh, from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Our subject for tonight is joy and rejoicing. Joy and rejoice. Uh, I believe most of us remember that uh, a year or so before and then after uh, coronavirus, the COVID-19 virus began, we were studying at Mount Sinai by way of systematic theology, which is any study that answers the question, what does the whole Bible teach us today about any given topic? Now, though I may not mention it uh, often enough, we're still focusing mainly right now on the word of God in written form. And just an FYI, we are continuing this study as the Lord allows me to continue as pastor and to participate uh, in the Christian education process for some years to come. I remember when I started as pastor of Mount Sinai, my biggest concern was would I have enough to preach and teach during my tenure? And at this point, I want to go on record by saying I'm sure that the Holy Spirit is well able to provide as long as needed. The Holy Spirit uh, for 20 years now has been giving me what to preach and what to teach. With this in mind, we finished spending some time looking at the idea last week of peace, which in a nutshell is the absence of worry. Now the plan is to biblically look at the idea of joy or rejoicing. Uh, peace and joy go together like gloves on a hand. Let's start by expanding our vocabulary or uh, uh, ideas concerning joy. Some words for joy and rejoicing are found in the New Testament that, that, that simply... Uh, Let's see, three of them, basically the same word is chaldro, chaldro, or sinchaldro, chaldro. 
Sinchandro. And they mean in the Greek to joy. They are the words for joy. Now, uh, Chandro means to be full of cheer or calmly happy. And I believe all true believers can relate to calmly happy or recognize being well off. When we realize that we are being well taken care of, this should cause joy to swell up on the inside. It should cause us to rejoice because we know we are being taken care of very well. We sometimes express joy when we're happy to see someone as they arrive. To, it, it, you know how it is when, when we haven't seen someone for a long time and we got word that they were coming to visit or we were going to visit them when we see them. At that moment, we can't help but to rejoice because we've seen a friend, a loved one that we haven't seen in a long time. God allows us to experience some things in our lives that will bring us joy or cause us to rejoice. Now, to be full of cheer says that something wrong is going uh, 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 is going on that is reversed. That will cause us great cheer when something wrong is going on in our lives. And, and we all should be familiar with that. that it, you, you can just get up one day, any day, and something wrong can go wrong in your life. But when something that has been going wrong, you saw it headed in the wrong direction. You saw the end that it was going to take you to. And then something happened to reverse it or change uh, its course or change your course where it would end up causing a cheer in you. When we've missed the presence of someone dear to us for a long period of time and their arrival finally reaches that void, that empty spot within us being filled is expressed on the outside by being cheerful, happy, joyful to see them once again. There was a story I was reading uh, the other day as I was studying, preparing for this lesson by Charles Spurgeon. He, he, this story is found in his encyclopedia of illustrations, and it tells the story of a man and his children and joy. Uh, we as believers can relate to this story because we have a father in heaven that sees us uh, the way this Englishman did his children. The man had seven children who had come one right after the other. He was a hardworking man and well spoken of in the community. His children were all asleep one day when his pastor stopped by for a visit. And the pastor says, as I went in and as I expressed the pleasure of the sight of their peaceful little faces, that, 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 that the peace on their face gave me, their father said, a, uh, these are times for them. They need not take any thought for themselves. And, and, and we all have been children and we experienced those times when, when our parents took care of us. They, they cared for us. They, they provided for us. And now, this, to finish this story, on the next Sunday, the man was in church and uh, his pastor says, uh, I dwell much on the happy state of the children exempt from care as they were. He's telling this story of what his eyes saw and experienced the uh, few days prior when he visited this ha house. And he went on to say that believers were the children of God and the Lord had commanded us to be careful. Don't worry about anything. For anything that is not don't not, not, not don't worry about something, but don't worry about anything. 
and he promises that he would care for us. The man understood uh, what the pastor was talking about, and it evidently brought him joy even to hear the pastor telling the story of his visit. Uh, and he expressed joy as the story was repeated by his pastor from the pulpit. And when we are reminded as parents that our children are well cared for, that reminder brings joy to our hearts and it can show in the joy that shows on our face and by propelling us to express that joy on the outside. Our children feel secure and don't have to worry as they grow. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 35, and I pray that you would bear with me as I read all of these verses because it's pertinent. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34 reads, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought, don't worry about it, for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on, is not the body more than meat and the body than raiment or clothes? Behold the fowl of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into bonds, and yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much more or better than they? Which of you, by taking thought or worrying about, can add one cubic to your statue? And why take ye thought for remnants or clothes to put on? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, Shall not much more he clothe you? O ye of little faith, therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all of these things do the Gentiles seek. For, you, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all of these things. And here's what we should do. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all of these things shall be added. When we seek God and his righteousness and his kingdom first, then we'll learn that God provides. Now take therefore no thoughts for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thoughts for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day of the evil thereof. And since we have a father that owns the world, and everything in it, including all of mankind. He even owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the hills. Luke chapter 12, verse 33 says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. First Peter 5 and 7 says, Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Note the word cast. It's not hesitantly handing it over the things that we worry about. That doesn't mean that we hesitantly hand them over to our Heavenly Father. But it says cast. In other words, uh, swing it back and then bring it forward and let it go. Turn it over to him, for he cares for us. God, our Heavenly Father, is the only one that extends such an invitation to his children. Jesus provides uh, in, 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 in just a little bit uh, into the, the digging, a little bit into the verses. Uh, uh, Jesus provides our access to God. The idea here is that Jesus Christ enables us to enjoy a continuing relationship with God. You can find more about that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, and chapter 3, verse 12. 
Paul speaks of this grace in which we stand as the realm into which Christ's redeeming work transfers us. To redeem means to free or to release from the slavery or bondage of sin by payment of a ransom. Paul stressed the fact that our being in this state is an act of God's grace. Our present position in relationship to God is all from and based on his grace. And our justification admits us to that position. To, to be admitted. You, you don't, don't go to the airport and expect to be uh, admitted to, to board a plane without a ticket. Don't, don't, don't go to the movie and try to get in without a ticket. Don't go to the fair and try to get on the Ferris wheel or, or, or the merry-go-round unless you've got a ticket. So uh, God's grace, and, and it, it, it's our admittance, our ticket into God's presence in a good relationship with God. Now, the last part of the verses focuses on that part of our reconciliation that we can look forward to with joyful confidence, with hope. Paul had in view the glory that we will experience when we stand in the Lord's presence one day. To reconcile means to remove the hostility making peace within enemies or between enemies. Second Samuel chapter 12, uh, verse uh, chapter six, verse 12 through 15, the English standard version. And, and this just blessed my heart as it relates to the overall lesson tonight. Second Samuel chapter six, verse 12 through 15. In the English standard version, it reads, and it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed Edom and all that belong to him because of the ark of God. In other words, the word of God that was contained in the ark. It was at Obed Edom's house. And while it was there, everything, uh, it, it was a blessing to Obed Edom and his old household and everything that he had. In other words, everything Obed Edom touched turned to gold. Figuratively. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore or carried the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, and there's the sermon itself behind these six steps and what was going on that I don't have time for now. Uh, those that carried the ark of the Lord had, before they had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and fattened animal. In, in, in other words, David along the way was giving God something to rejoice over. He was rejoicing over God's blessings and, and he was glad about it. He, as he rejoiced, it caused God to rejoice because God was the one blessing him. And when God blesses us, we ought to not uh, uh, get overtaken with a blessing, but the one that did the blessing. Verse 14 says, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen effort. And there's another story. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. The ark carried the word of God and it symbolized the presence of God. And when we start, stand in reverence to the reading of God's word as we do at Mount Sinai, it's an acknowledgement of the entrance of God. And the entrance of God is an indication that God's blessings will follow. When we allow God in, when we seek God first, then his blessings Follow. And while the ark was in Obed Edom's house, his house was blessed. 
when the word of God abides in our house, when we allow Jesus or the Holy Spirit to abide in our house, or as he did with uh, uh, Mary and uh, Martha and Lazarus, uh, 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 when we allow the, the, the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, God's blessings will flow. And it's still that way. Wherever the word of God is, blessings will overflow and it will cause joy and rejoicing. It was the word that was made flesh and went about doing good, raising the dead, giving sight to the blind, loosening the tongues that were stammering, lifting up bowed down heads, setting free those that were held captive by sin. And how did he do all of that? For us in this day and age, one Friday, on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary, he died a sinner's death. In other words, he died in our place to pay the price to atone for our sin. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. But early, good God Almighty, the third day morning, he rose with all power in his hand. And whatever you're going through, if you allow God's word to abide in your household, if you allow the Holy Spirit to move into your heart, whatever you're going through, you can look for God to use a word, a three letter conjunction, B-U-T, but to turn that situation around. He rose with all power in heaven and in earth in his hand. And now we can cast all of our cares upon him. And he is already on Calvary more than demonstrating that he cares for us. So, children, have joy. Rejoice. As God, as, as, as God allows his word to dwell in you, to come alive in you, watch the blessings flow. Let us pray. Our Father, help us to recognize when you have uh, given us a reason to rejoice and have joy even uh, so that we can praise you and bring you joy. In the name of your beloved son, Jesus Christ, we pray thee. Amen. By now, a lot of us should have voted. Uh, but if you haven't, remember, vote, vote, vote by November 3rd. I think uh, from the 14th of this month through the 29th of this month in Tennessee, Early voting is going on. I know in the city of Memphis, early voting is going on. But find wherever you are the time for early voting. It tends to be a lot easier unless you're in some of the red states uh, that usually vote Republican. There's a larger number of uh, Democrats voting. So, but uh, vote, vote. And uh, in closing, don't forget to wear your mask and practice social distancing and wash your hands often and God will butt this coronavirus. He will turn it around. He will change the outcome that we might see now and give us a good end. Trust him and never doubt and he will surely bring us out. So long. I love you. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.